Hello, and welcome to the ninth episode of the ESG Experience Podcast, brought to you by Gobi, the ESG platform. I'm Carlos Solano, Manager of ESG for Fund Management here at Gobi. And I'm Ryan Nelson, Gobi CEO, and we're your hosts for this podcast. Whether you're an ESG expert or just dipping your toes in the ESG universe to understand how it could help with engaging stakeholders, mitigating risk, and attracting investors, this podcast is for you. Together, we will navigate the alphabet soup of ESG, discuss ideas, review strategies, and share industry news and trends. In this episode, we'll be discussing how ESG is integrated into measuring risks and opportunities in lending. To help us with this conversation, we're pleased to be joined by Tim Kleiman, Managing Director and Head of ESG for Golub Capital. Tim joined Golub in 2011 and is a Managing Director at the, and the Head of ESG. He is responsible for overseeing the implementation of the firm's ESG practices, communicating them to key stakeholders and driving continuous improvement. He also supports the firm's investor partners group as a subject matter expert for different private funds. Prior to joining Gold of Capital, Mr. Kleiman was an investment professional at DE Shaw & Company, where he focused on fundamental credit and equity strategies. Prior to this position, Mr. Kleiman was a business analyst at McKinsey & Company, where he advised clients in the financial services and consumer sectors. Mr. Kleiman earned his BA degree summa cum laude form in psychology from Yale University. Tim, thank you so much for joining. Oh, thank you, Carlos and Ryan, for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I don't know if you know this, but I live in, in Brooklyn, New York, and podcasts are kind of the highest form of cultural currency in Brooklyn. So you are massively increasing my credibility in my neighborhood. So I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Uh, that's good. That's good to hear. I've, um, they're becoming, you know, to the point where they're pretty popular. But for the last couple of years, that was the thing I would use for authority in any room. Like people would be having an argument right? and I'd be like, well, this is how it is. I heard it on a podcast. And that was I like heard the it end on of the conversation. NPR, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was like the end of the conversation if it was on a, on a podcast. Um, well, Tim, before we get into it, I, I did um, want to read a little bit about uh, Gallup Capital here too. So, so I'm going to read this quick note here. For over 25 years, Perfect. Gallup Capital has defined and refined direct lending providing reliable, creative, and compelling financing solutions to companies backed by private equity sponsors. Gallup Capital pioneered the one-stop or Unitranch gold loan, and, we can, and Gallup continues to develop new structures to support their lending partners. The expertise and disciplined processes enable Gallup to respond with speed, consistency, and reliability, inspiring repeat, repeat clients again and again. Today, Gallup Capital has over $40 billion under management, with lending offices in Chicago, New York, San Francisco, and London. So welcome again. That's all correct, right? That all still holds true for Gallup that, Capital, I imagine? That, that sounds right. Great. Well, again, you know, we're very appreciative to have you and um, with your resume and experience. Um, we're excited about this, this conversation. And uh, I, I, I love New York. Personally, I spent quite a bit of time there. And love it, love Brooklyn, love Manhattan, and um, so I'm sure we'll sprinkle in some some stuff about that. Um, but can, to kind of, yeah, great. Um, to get started, so ESG, which uh, you know, our most of our audience base understands at this point to be to stand for uh, to be an acronym for environmental, social, and governance. Um, and I guess what is you know, it's something that the, that the industry understands now, but. How did you end up in ESG? What is your journey that made this discipline, I guess, if you, if you want to call it of ESG, uh, something that that you know is essentially you know your focus? Yeah, no, I as as Carlos mentioned, I, I've been at Gallup Capital for uh, almost eleven years now, um, and one of the reasons I've stuck around so long, and one of the reasons why I'm proud to be at Gallup Capital is that we've been believers in ESG for as long as I've been there, and, and I think even longer than that. Um, you know, again. Using my Brooklyn hat, I sometimes say that we were into ESG before it was cool. Um, mm -hmm. Partially, this is you know just a matter of culture and values, right? Like you know you you think about the impact of your actions on on the broader community because it's the right thing to do. Uh, but it's also good for business. I mean, we uh, have I think we've been able to make really smart credit decisions for a long time because we're you know, for lack of a better way to put it, paranoid about everything that can go wrong in a deal. And if you're not including ESG in that analysis, then you're not being paranoid enough. 
Um, so, you know, on a business level, we view ESG as part of kind of prudent underwriting, and that's our bread and butter. You know, personally, uh, I, I never set out to become a, an investment firm person. You know, my parents were hippies, but uh, I've always liked the idea that, you know, as investors, you know, our choices have ramifications. It's not just about our P&L. They, they affect society as a whole. And so it behooves us to be intentional about those choices. And I think that a lot of the, the fundamental impulse behind ESG is about creating that sense of intentionality and that sense of, you know, sort of accountability for the choices we make at investors. Um, so, you know, we, and when the firm decided to kind of bring its commitment to ESG to the next level and build version 2.0 of ESG at Gallup Capital, uh, I jumped at the opportunity to be part of that. Um, you know, I'd say in 2020, we, we built our roadmap for what that looks like with a number of the heads of our investment teams and, and our operational functions. Um, and we thought that the roadmap needed to be owned by someone, someone senior who was accountable to the president of the company. Um, and I jumped at that opportunity and I, I'm really grateful for it. Well, that's great. That's, that's very interesting. I, I, I'm glad to you know, hear you say someone senior at the company. Um, I think I've told the story many times, but the journey has always been, you know, from 12, 15 years ago for, for us, we saw a lot of people. It was the, the most junior person who mm -hmm. was doing this as an aside to their other job. And, and now we do see a lot of very senior people, C-level people, um, uh, actually whole executive teams that have part of their performance-based bonus around mm -hmm. uh, ESG. Um, so we see a lot of that. So that's great. And I appreciate your comment about the intentionality of it. That that makes, reminds me of Gobi's vision. Our, our, our vision is that if you really want to value a company or talk about you know, if a company is a good company or not, the financial statements, the performance is one thing. Oh, great. They're growing this fast or they're this big or whatever. But that doesn't tell you the whole story. It's ESG Absolutely. that gives you the rest of the story of do I like this company? Am I glad this company exists? I need the ESG record and the financial record to actually decide if I like this company. I completely agree with that premise. One common view Tim, uh, that sometimes gets um, kind of thrown around in direct lending or fixed income or credit asset management is really why bother with ESG if we don't own the equity, if we're not direct owners? Uh, what would you say to those comments? And I think that the it's a really good question. And I think that, you know, thinking about one's role as a lender versus an owner is, is an important piece of, of the story. Um, and there are similarities and differences. I think there are more similarities than there are differences. Um, but, you know, it's, a, it, it's I think, a broad, in broad strokes, you know, ESG is newer in the private credit world. You know, our, our colleagues in private equity and in public markets have uh, more experience with ESG and thinking and communicating their story about ESG in, in a coherent way. Um, and so private credit, we're, we're kind of catching up a little bit. I think there's a lot of serious work going on, um, you know, to help the private credit industry learn and, and coalesce around a series of, of best practices. Um, but I think that, Carlos, the, uh, the kind of straw man argument you laid out is, is not too different from what you might have heard from a lender, you know, call it, you know, five, 10 years ago. You know, there is a, a view right. that's like, you know, we're, well, we're not in any, you know, quote unquote, bad industries from an ESG perspective. And, you know, we're lending at the top of the capital structure. So it would take a lot for you investor to experience any losses because of some ESG factor. So, you know, don't worry about it. Um, you know, if you, you try to make that argument today and you'd be laughed out of the room, right? Like we all, we all know now that ESG is part of risk analysis and, and really kind of the, uh, the things that we consider ESG risks are credit risks fundamentally. Um, you know, I think the, there is sort of a, a, a kernel of truth to that view that I, I was making fun of a little bit ago, which is, you know, it does take a lot to make a risk material. Um, but I think that what we've seen certainly is that ESG risks can become material really quickly and can lead to material issues really quickly. Uh, so it, you know, sort of behooves you as an investor to, to stay ahead of the curve on that. Great. Thank you. If there are any examples that come to mind, that'd be uh, greatly appreciated, but it makes sense. The trend 
as you mentioned, is moving in that direction. That's what we've seen in recent, not even recent, but for a couple of years now, um, conferences yeah, and no. industry groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it, it kind of comes down to, you know, Ryan, as you were mentioning, you, you don't get a complete picture unless ESG is part of it. And it, in some sense, I think is a, a leading indicator of other things that we care about when analyzing a business, either for an investment or, you know, as, an, as someone we want to entrust our capital to as an investment manager. And, you know, if you're an investor looking at us as a lender, say, and, and we're not convincing you that we're taking ESG seriously, you know, you've got to scratch your head and wonder like, okay, well, what else are these, these guys not taking seriously? Um, you know, candidly, we work with a lot of private equity firms, many of whom are, are very serious about ESG. Um, and if they weren't, that would be a big red flag because, you know, that is part of the long-term value creation of, of private equity. Uh, it, it has to be done in a sustainable way. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. Um, so I think that there's there's a, a, an increasing amount of collaboration among owners and lenders in trying to um, get our arms around DSG and, and, and you know, reduce DSG risks and increase sustainability. Um, there's still you know, going to be differences, right? We don't own the company. We can't hire and fire the management team. We don't set strategy. Uh, but I think there's a lot of room for collaboration, and, and I think that's likely to continue. So is there, is that even driven as far as saying there's uh, some sort of line or, or sector that you just don't even want to do business with? Kind of like saying from an ESG perspective, you're not good enough or we were, you know, we refuse to mm -hmm. participate in this sector. Has, has it gotten to that point? Yeah, I, mean, it's, uh, I, I would answer that with a qualified yes. Um, and what I, the reason I provide qualified part is not just to appease our, our legal and compliance department, but also just because, and as a matter of policy, we don't exclude specific sectors. Um, I'm happy to talk about, about why we, we don't do that sort of a, a, as we go. But um, as a practical matter, there's a bunch of sectors that we don't touch from a, a credit perspective. And a lot of them are kind of, again, the quote unquote bad sectors from an ESG perspective. So, you know, for example, we we don't want to have anything to do with companies involved in, in fossil fuel extraction. Uh, right. We have no edge when it comes to forecasting oil prices. I'm not sure anyone does. Um, and you know, we don't want to have the success or failure of our investment depend on, on commodity markets that are volatile and beyond our control. Um, and I think a, a, there's a philosophical question of, okay, well, well, does this mean that we're passing on these deals on ESG grounds? And I think the, the honest answer is not really. I think that, you know, there's a case for potentially, you know, if we invested in energy companies, you, know, you might think it would be reasonable to invest in a natural gas company because at least that's better than coal. Or you might think you shouldn't even touch that because, you know, anything with hydrocarbons is, is pointing in the wrong direction. And, you know, for us, we don't have to resolve that argument. <laughs> it's, I think that's a tough argument to resolve because there's, again, kernels of truth on both sides. Um, but we don't need to apply that sort of subjective ethical filter to end up in the same place of saying, no, we don't want to expose our capital to this, this industry. Um, I think there's often a degree of ethical judgment that I think is reasonable, right? Like you're an investor, mm -hmm. you, if you want your capital to match what you believe is you know, right, uh, that's a totally legitimate perspective. I'd say we have a, a very uh, vibrant and constructive uh, dialogue with some of our investors who think we should have exclusions. Um, you know, I would say we generally prefer to leave room for nuance, but I, I think we're very sympathetic to their point of view. Yeah, very interesting. Um, uh, that policy makes sense to me. I mean, you're, it sounds like you're making you know, sound decisions as as needed. And um, like we kind of hinted, I think, at you know ESG in a way being an indicator of you know, an industry or sector or particularly a, a, an owner or a company. Um, it always reminds me of this story that I've told the M&M theory. You know, there was some some band, I forget who it was, Van Halen or oh, something. Oh, I think it was Van Halen. Yeah. I think. Van Halen, yeah, the old M&M. Yeah, if they found that one detail in the kind, they, they would just walk in and they would check the, the jar. Yeah. And if there were no brown M&Ms or, or only brown M&Ms or whatever it was, then they didn't have was, to check yeah. everything else. Right, because they're like, wow, they did this one thing that was buried in the contract, so it's an yeah. indication that it's a good, you know, it's a good thing. So I, that's interesting, Tim. So uh, there was some news 
recently that Golub Capital re uh, became a signatory of the Institutional Limited Partners Association, ILPA, Diversity in Action Initiative. Can you tell us a little bit more about this partnership? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, this was a, an initiative that was personally important to me and, and to you know the leaders of the company to be part of. Um, you know, just by way of context about what the initiative is, you know, when we joined uh, in March of 2021, I think we were part of the second, you know, cohort of folks who joined. Um, there were about 130 signatories at that time. You know, as of our last quarterly roundtable, it was over 200. So really a huge amount of traction in, in a very short period of time, which I think uh, does, it, it's a credit to our industry that people are taking this seriously. It's also a sign that our industry has a lot of work to do. Um, and I think it's important that, you know, as members of that industry, we're doing our part to 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 address some of these issues. Um, you know, formally, what the um, the diversity in action initiative isn't about is it's all about connecting, you know, us with our peers to talk about best practices, you know, to discuss common challenges. And and I think that Bill has done a really nice job curating a forum where, you know, investors, asset managers, consultants, other stakeholders can come together and, and have a kind of safe and candid environment for, for discussing um, these issues. Um, I've certainly gotten some great ideas from hearing uh, other members uh, of the, the uh, Alliance speak on, on these quarterly roundtables, and hopefully we'll be able to give them some interesting ideas as well over time. Yeah, some of these, I, I like that kind of creating a, a good place to have a conversation and, and a safe place. Some of these conversations can be, um, you know, tough to approach. Like even, you know, smart people, you want to be politically correct in, in their sensitivity and you're worried that maybe you don't know exactly what's appropriate and how to address the conversation oh, yeah. so that they don't don't happen. So I appreciate when we say, hey, this is a safe space. If you say the wrong thing or if you don't, you know, whatever, you know, we can step through it and um so I, I think that's that's very cool yeah um, i think mean, this is hard i mean it, it really it it shouldn't be hard right like in a perfect right. world it wouldn't be hard but you know when you're dealing with you know root causes of inequity that go back you know decades sure. and centuries right you're you're not gonna you're not gonna have all the answers right away i'll be the first to admit we don't have all the answers um and i think that you know to your point that kind of is a very humbling perspective and we mm -hmm. ought to approach these questions with a degree of humility no that's a great way to say it no I really i try and encourage that when when we can um how are you measuring esg at Gallup capital do you have specific focus areas or how have you put some sort of uh you know performance base around it yeah i i, I distinguish a little bit between what we do on the investment side and what we do sort of internally for the firm um i think the investment side tends to be what people focus on um, and for us, the the real kind of metrics and key issues vary by industry and, and by subsector. Um, you know, when, when I described earlier how we had this roadmap for ESG version 2.0, a big part of that was developing under templates that are customized by industry and, and even in some cases by industry subsector that really hone in on what are the ESG risks that are most likely to become financially material given the context of that industry and sector. So, you know, for example, if we, we, we do a lot of software deals where we have a very big and a very successful uh, enterprise software lending uh, franchise, and there, you might not think of that as even having any ESG issues, right? But there's a whole slew of issues around data protection, consumer privacy, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, all the cybersecurity, right? Um, and you know, those all speak to governance and and to some extent the social side of things. So that there are real ESG risks, and we want to hone in on those when we do a software deal. You know, if we were to lend to a specialty retailer, for instance, you know, those issues are still relevant, but you also would add a whole layer about worker health and safety, for example. Um, so there there are some differences right. between sectors and subsectors. Um, but I, I, I think that the, uh, you know, the, the common theme behind a lot of our work is, uh, you know, we're big believers in standardization. Um, you know, I think it's, I don't know if it's officially required reading, but it might as well be a required reading. Atul Gawanda's checklist manifesto, you know, we're very big believers in replicable processes and, and by designing these templates to be as comprehensive as we can, uh, we like to think that that's improving the consistency with which we're, we're analyzing these issues. Um, you know, on the firm level, the I, I think we're 
we're wrestling a little bit with this question of like, what's the right, what are the right things to measure and, and manage and, and incentivize? Um, it's tricky because, you know, numbers never tell the whole story. Um, and I think most of our, I think it would be fair to say that a lot of our goals are uh, for the near term are really focused more on on actions that we're taking. If we can't necessarily guarantee the outcome is going to come out one way or the other, but we follow through on the commitments we've made to you know expand the diversity of our recruit uh, our applicant pool for job positions, for example. You know that's something we can do. That's something in our control, and and you know I'm certainly accountable for part of that as as our uh, you know the members of our HR team. Um, and I think that a lot of the firm level ESG issues um, and D&I issues uh, fall into that category. Yeah, no, that's um, that's all very smart. And again, I'm um, impressed to hear how uh, mature this is, like you said, and, you know, maybe a little bit the industry, a little bit behind um, equities and, you know, other public markets and that, but still, um, you know, you guys have a lot, lot going on. That's great. Uh, you mentioned DNI. You already talked about. You know, we talked briefly about the, the challenge, how to approach um, these conversations with with humility. I really like that. Um, DNI, diversity and inclusion, of course, is a hot topic, if you will. Um, we one of the, the frequent questions that we hear from our clients is, why do DNI programs uh, fail? What are the components of a successful mm. DNI strategy? Um, do you have anything that, that you can offer um, as advice on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, before I before I jump in, you know, first, just to reiterate that point about humility, you know, again, I, I don't have all the answers. Our firm doesn't have all the answers. Um, I'm happy to talk about how we're thinking about the issues, but I, I, I want to acknowledge that I'm not saying, you know, this is what it, you know, we know the secret sauce behind what makes this a successful sure. program. Um, I'd also acknowledge, look, I'm I'm a white guy, I'm able-bodied, I'm cis male, you know, I'm I'm gay, so I get like one diversity point, but like there's a lot of you know aspects of this question that I know I approach from a position of privilege, and so sure. you know, on on balance, I'd much rather be listening than talking. Um, but you graciously invited me to do some talking, so I'm going to you know set that principle to the side for now. Um, you know, I think that the I, I'm glad we started with that question about the industry initiative, because I think it points to the fact that there are multiple layers on which, you know, as a, as a business, and you can kind of practice good diversity, inclusion, and equity practices. There's what you do as a firm is one level. There's what you do as an industry as another level. And then there's kind of what you do as society on the third level. And we think it's important to attack all three of those um, because they're ultimately linked to one another. Um, so on the industry level, we talked a bit about how, how the ILPA forum is, is really helping us collectively identify best practices. You know, at the firm level, you know, really we're focused on recruitment and retention. Um, we have very talented, diverse employees. I think I looked at the data most recently and you know, half of our employee base are women or identify as people of color. And, and that's, you know, but I, I don't want to pat ourselves on the back for that, but I, but it's, you know, it's a promising indicator in my mind. And I think there's room that we can do more. Um, and part of that comes down to making sure that we're seeking talent from a broad and representative uh, set of uh, uh, channels. Um, just to give one example, because I find it's always helpful to hear concrete tactics as you're designing these programs. Uh, we recently partnered with an organization called Jopwell, uh, J-O-P-W-E-L-L, -L, for those who want to follow up with them. Uh, they're terrific. They've been fabulous partners. They're a, a career advancement platform for uh, designed primarily for Black, Latinx, and, and Native American uh, students and young professionals. Um, and, you know, they... They've been great at surfacing candidates for us, and I'm very optimistic that this partnership is going to continue to, to, to flourish. Um, and we're looking to replicate that with, with other organizations. Um, you know, on the societal level, you know, there's a lot, a lot has been said about kind of like corporate social responsibility over the years. And, you know, we think of what we do as impact philanthropy. That's kind of the, the tag that we put around it because we want to focus on philanthropic activities that have the potential to really move the needle um, on big societal issues. And I think the, the coolest thing we're doing on that front is uh, building a network of Gallup Capital Social Impact Labs at a number of leading business schools. Um, you know, the core idea there is bringing together leading academics and the next generation of business leaders uh, to enhance the effectiveness of organizations that are solving social problems. Um, 
you know, in particular, uh, it's about enhancing the effectiveness of organizations led by and serving historically underserved and marginalized communities. Um, we've committed over $10 million to, to launch labs at uh, Stanford, Kellogg, and, and, um, and we have ambitious plans to do more uh, because we think that you know, these types of partnerships between academia, business, and nonprofit sector um, are really the key to making change on the, on the societal level, and we're happy to do whatever we can to catalyze that. That those are great examples. Thank you so much for sharing that, Tim. I, I really like how proactive um, that approach is to not only joining another program that is addressing these issues, but actually creating and helping lead some of these these conversations and programs. Uh, so thank you for that. And maybe just coming back and tying it back again to the firm level, uh, you came up with an ESG roadmap last year. Just curious to know your takeaways for implementing that in 2021, and what are you looking forward to in 2022? Yeah, no, that's a, it's a great question. It's a, one that's very timely as, as we're doing our planning. Um, and <laughs> I want to go back. You know, Ryan, you used use the term journey at the beginning of the conversation, and you know, you know as well as I do that ESG people love talking about their journeys. Um, <laughs> so I'm to, I, I would position what we're doing as part of that journey of, of you know continuous improvement. Um, I think. The big positive learning for me for 2021 is just how much our organization has embraced the new policies and procedures that, that we've put into place. You know, our investment teams have had the busiest year in, in history for us. You know, it's been it's been an absolutely you know, uh, grueling year <laughs> for, for a lot of our lending professionals. And, you know, you could imagine a bit of resentment about, oh, now I have to fill out these like ESG templates. What's this all about? If I'm too busy. And there's been none of that. There's been deep acceptance from the investment teams that this is part of what our responsibilities are and part of what helps us make good investment decisions. And at the end of the day, like we you know live or die based on how good our credit results are. And so if because we've you know been able to I don't even think we had to work that hard to persuade the investment teams that you know this is part of good credit analysis and and the responsibility falls on the deal teams themselves. It's not just kind of you know ESG person coming in from the outside. Uh, that level of of uh, eager embracing of the uh, of, of the new initiatives is really really encouraging. Um, I think that's. Uh, you know, when I think about where we have opportunities to improve, it's just, you know, we still don't know what we've learned yet from this year. And I think we're going to, as we look back over the next couple of months, uh, have kind of better ideas about, okay, this is what really worked. This was something that we did that wasn't that effective. Um, you know, these are good ideas that we've heard from some of our peers that we're not doing. Um, I don't know exactly what the, what those are, but I, I think the, the theme of just kind of continuous improvement and, and raising the bar is, is really where we're headed for 2022. Great. I, ju I do have one quick follow-up to that. And what you're Definitely. measuring in implementing the, this roadmap, um, some of the recent talks is the difference between inputs, such as writing a policy versus action, and some of these engagement um, just activity. But then ultimately what we want to track is outcomes, right? And actually moving, for example, diversity, which it sounds like uh, from the examples you gave, you're doing a great job at. And just curious to know how those conversations go, if um, if you have any recommendations or lessons learned uh, for driving outputs, not just inputs and activity, if that makes, if that makes sense. I think it makes perfect sense. I mean, I, I think the, the premise is really right on, which is, you know, measure it and it moves. And, you know, it's, I think, you know, Often the challenge in ESG world and DNI world is okay. Well, like, what's the right thing to measure? And by right thing to measure, I mean, what do you measure that gives you the outcome that you want to have and helps you see that outcome? So I think it's a really deep question that you asked. Um, I, I, again, I wouldn't say that I have all the answers. Um, I think that on the ESG side of the thing, on the investment side of the house, say. Um, it's trickier to have those feedback loops because, you know, again, as we're, we're lenders, and so uh, our best case scenario is nothing goes wrong, right? Like we get paid back, mm -hmm. and so it, it, if we're, you know, seeing a lot of successful, you know, payoffs and you know, good credit outcomes, you know, 
we can't rest on our laurels and say, well, uh, we've done a, we've done everything we could on the ESG front. We don't know if you know there were issues that maybe we missed that you know could have that we should have caught, but ended up working out. Um, so, for being like kind of intellectually honest with ourselves, it's really hard to say that you know one specific you know type of thing that you're looking at did or didn't cause a credit issue that that ultimately is measurable. Um, and that's why I think we've really tried to customize our approach by industry and subsector just to maximize the likelihood that we're hitting all of the, the key ESG issues in that sector. Um, on the firm level, uh, I, I think it it took a willingness to go outside of our comfort zone a bit. I think um, you know there's it's it can often feel fraught to try to you know reduce people, you know, your, your rich and vibrant team to a set of, you know, okay, categories and put them in boxes and count the people in the boxes. You know, there, there's something about that that doesn't really feel consistent with the spirit of, of, of d &I, but at the same time, it's the only way to know what your starting point is and to know kind of how that's changing over time. Um, and we've had, you know, I'd say uh, fundamentally constructive, but, but tough conversations internally about, you know, how should we track, what should we track? Uh, what should we report? How do we report it in a way that's, you know, both uh, clear-eyed about what, you know, we know we have opportunities to improve, and also that celebrates the things that we think we're we've been doing well. Um, it's hard to find the right set of, you know, metrics for any of these efforts, but I think the process of trying to wrestle with that question had a benefit for us in terms of just clarifying, uh, you know, what should we do strategically, um, even if we can't measure it perfectly, like what can we, what can we do strategically to drive towards the outcomes we would like to see? Yeah, that, that's great. It, it is difficult. I'll tell you one thing we do that it is impactful at Gobi, that's what we're trying to do is, is gather appropriate data, present some context to private equity about what that means. And if we're talking at the firm level and internally, the power we've showed people Okay, here is the, in your particular region, here is the average percent for investment firms of um, women on boards in invested companies or women in management. And the number itself is concerning. Okay, so let's say it's in some case, it's like 20% of the companies across these investment firms in their portfolio companies, they have um, 20 percent have women in management. So you're like, wow, that's not good. Then you look at your your firms that you've invested in and you're like, we're at 14 percent. So right then you're like, yeah. hey, man, at least let's be the average. You know, is that yeah, where our bar is? Percent. Maybe, maybe not. But you're definitely inspired to do something, you know, if you look at it that way. So um, it's not always that the answer or, or whatever. But but putting that data in front of you often uh, inspires people to do something. Yeah, and, and Ryan, one of the things I've I've liked about you know what I understand about Gobi's approach is is very much this idea of context. You know, I think one of uh, uh, one of my pet peeve phrases, um, and my colleagues will tell you I have a lot of them, but one of them is the data speaks for itself. And like, mm. no, data never speaks for itself. Like, data takes context. Like, if I tell you the number of this thing is like five million, how do you know whether that's meaningful or not without context? Mm -hmm. And so I think that you know the lack of comparability across firms and how they think about and measure these issues, I, I'm sympathetic to investors finding that frustrating because it becomes hard to say, okay, where where does this firm stack up against its peers? Um, and at the same time, it makes it harder for us to say, okay, well, are we really behind the curve? Are we ahead of the curve? You know, are we a little bit of both? Um, so I, I, I you know commend you for for you know being part of the solution on on putting context around these these kind of hard to define concepts yeah and no, i appreciate that and, and we encourage we are we commend our customers who publish data or at least look at it internally sometimes publish it externally or at least share it with their limited partners that data that's not necessarily or information that's not necessarily great of course they try and bring the context to position themselves better but I'm, it's still early in the people that are willing to even look at it. Then they look yeah. at it and like, ah, it's not great, but now we, we've done it. Other firms haven't even looked at it. So, so yep. you know, that's, um, uh, yeah, in, I don't know, interesting that, that people are doing that. Um, well, you know, I, I appreciate you sharing all this today. I know you said um, you, you, you enjoy listening. So I do thank you for setting that aside. and. Um, 
uh, speaking as well. I really appreciate what you're you're doing at your firm. And uh, the reason that we're in the private equity industry, of course, is because this capital uh, is very influential. Yeah. And, you know, capital is, you know, and you can say it really drives the, the world. So um, yeah. you, we are able to have a lot of impact because we're helping firms that have a lot of impact and drive a lot of business and drive the next companies that are going to get to their next level. So it's Absolutely. really great that, that you're looking at it from the firm perspective and how you uh, how you lend. So um, that's great. Oh, I do want to mention, you said context. This is what I almost forgot. Context yeah. and nuance. Those are like yeah. words. You know, there's a nuance to it. And everyone's like, well, let's not focus on that. And I'm like, no, no, let's address the nuances. Like, that's the fun part. You know, yeah. that, that, that matters. But you got to bring context. Um, well, Tim, uh, I want to bring a little bit of... Uh, is it levity? Brevity? <laughs> Brevity means free. Levity oh, no. to the conversation here at the end. Uh, um, yeah, we have a, a fan favorite short little game here that we play. Uh -huh. um, it's called, it's very easy. All you have to do is say the word uh, beans or beer, and so there's a 50% oh, chance. Yeah, to yeah. Right. In the world hey, of crafts. On a couple of your, uh, your, your earlier episodes, I was very nervous about my hit rate. Yeah. Yeah, it's coming. So our, our interesting thing is, you know, in this world of artisan and craft, and uh, which, again, I very much enjoy, but there's so much great coffee out there now and, and so much great uh, beer. And, and I, I really try to find um, some ESG connection. I, I struggle. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. But all you got to do is say beans or beer. I'm going to tell you a place. Okay? Ready? Okay. Ready. East, East Rock Brewing Company. East Rock Brewing Company. Rock. Huh. East Rock. East Rock. Um, well, I feel like you're kind of leading me down the path of, uh, you know, questioning whether like is, is brewing, I, I'm, I'm really kind of like trying to get into your head of like, or is brewing like a misdirection or is it actually just literally it says brewing in the name and even though you can brew coffee, like we always think about a brewing beer. Uh, East Rock sounds to me like a, like a craft beer. So I, I would I'm tentatively and reluctantly put my chips on that. So you're going to say beer, even though you were worried that I was trying to lead you down a path? <laughs> yeah, I, it's uh, I, it's a leap of faith, but I think we're okay. going to go with it. Okay, well done. You are correct. Um, All right, excellent. <laughs> does uh, does East Rock mean anything to you or no? Uh, not really, but it sounds it sounds very uh, sturdy, <laughs> so like okay. a nice hearty type of words. So uh, I, well, I'm sure the beer is excellent. I believe it's in New Haven. Which I believe you're, oh, you spent there you some go. time there, right? Indeed, indeed, you did at Yale. Yeah. Um, and so thank you for a trip back. Good, good. Well, you should check out East Rock. As far as I know, a family-run business. Yeah. Uh, if you're a beer drinker, a family-run business. Um, but yeah, I thought maybe uh, you, you, you know, East Rock might mean something to you out there in uh, in uh, New Haven. No, Good. Thank, thank well, you so much for having me, Ryan. I, I really, really appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, talk to you and, and Carlos no. and really appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you, Tim. I really appreciate you being here and taking the time to talk to us. Uh, for everyone listening, thank you for joining us on the ESG Experience Podcast. There's a new episode every month. So if you enjoyed your time with us today, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast directory. And our next guest, uh, the first guest for 2022, would be Laurie Coy from William Blair. She works closely with clients, key stakeholders, and colleagues around the globe to deliver best-in-class programs and approaches for charitable giving and ESG strategies. Thanks to all of our loyal subscribers for continuing to listen and support our podcast. Uh, we want to continue the if you want to continue the conversation, please follow us on your favorite social media channels with the hashtag ESG Experience.